So hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Avedar. I am the programming director at Hamilton Artists Inc. I'm also a first generation immigrant and a settler to this land. Uh, I want to start by giving a land acknowledgement. I've been thinking a lot about the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's granted me a new perspective and appreciation for this land. Uh, the earth, the plants, and the animals have comforted me amid all the anxieties of the pandemic. I found a sense of peace in watching spring take hold, in feeling the sun and feeling the wind, in seeing the insects again, in planting seeds and caring for seedlings, and even in witnessing the resilience of what I might consider weeds and pests in my vegetable garden. It has all reminded me of my privilege in having access to housing and having a steady job. Present day Hamilton is on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. It is covered by Treaty 3, the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792. This land is directly adjacent to Haldeman Treaty Territory, or what we know today as the Six Nations Reserve. After the American Revolution, many Haudenosaunee who were allied with the British emigrated here from their traditional lands south of Lake Ontario. The Haldeman Proclamation of 1784 promised the Haudenosaunee six miles of land on each side of the Grand River from its mouth to its source. Today, the Six Nations of the Grand River have access to only 5% of what was originally promised to them. Present-day Hamilton is also covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to peacefully share the resources in and around the Great Lakes and to preserve them for generations to come. The dish represents the land and the spoon represents the importance of only taking what we need so that there's enough left for others. As a not-for-profit arts organization, Hamilton Artists Inc. is committed to engaging with all the issues that affect artists in our community. And we know that access to housing and safe work are some of those issues. Uh, we're really excited to be collaborating with the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic on this workshop tonight. Uh, the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic uh, worked very hard to provide access to legal services for all members of our community. They have language interpreters as well as specific programs for Black, Indigenous, and the LGBTQIS plus community. Uh, I'm very, very excited to um, also be working with Factory Media Center, who are co-presenting uh, co this workshop with us tonight. Uh, tonight's workshop is going to cover um, the basics of your rights as a tenant and as a worker in context of COVID-19. Um, our facilitator, Stephanie Cox, is a part of the housing team over at the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, and uh, she's been working as a lawyer since 2014. Uh, so uh, Stephanie is going to run through the workshop. She's going to cover the housing component first. We're going to uh, stop and take some questions. Um, and then she's going to do the, the part on workers' rights. And then we'll do questions again. So if you have to leave at some point in the middle, don't worry. This video will be available uh, on our Facebook page afterwards. And we're also um, going to be posting it on our YouTube account in the next little while. Uh, for the Q&A, you can type your questions directly in uh, the chat function of this Facebook Live, uh, but we also have prepared a shared Google document just in case you don't feel comfortable posting your questions on Facebook, maybe you're friends with your boss or your landlord. Uh, you can uh, click the link and go to that shared document and type your questions in there. And we'll, uh, we'll look in both places to give questions to Stephanie to answer for us. So without further ado, um, thank you all for joining us. And I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome Stephanie Cox. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting us on this great collaboration, uh, especially during these really unprecedented times. Um, so as uh, Abadar has mentioned, uh, the point of this presentation is to provide you with an overview of tenant rights and worker rights. And while I'll provide an overview, uh, there are certainly um, points that uh, I am going to elaborate on that are far more related to themes um, with respect to COVID. And so we'll be focusing on those and essentially addressing common um, 
concerns uh, that tenants and workers have during uh, this time. But first, uh, I'd like to explain that the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic is a legal clinic um, that provides legal advice, support, and representation to low-income members of our community. Now, anyone has the ability to call our office, regardless of their income, and receive legal advice and legal information with respect to uh, their legal matters. Uh, but when it comes to representation, there is a financial eligibility threshold. Nonetheless, please do not be deterred. If you have any uh, legal issues, please do not have hesitate to give us a call. Even though we are not providing face-to-face -face legal services during uh, these, these times during COVID, uh, we are still providing uh, legal advice over the phone. Uh, and our number's on the screen there at 905-527-4572. And so if you call us, you'll be directed to a legal caseworker who will return your call and answer uh, any legal question that you have. We specialize in landlord and tenant law, employment law. We practice some immigration, some WSIB. Um, and for those who are pursuing social assistance in OW or ODSP or have had their benefits interrupted, we also will provide representation um, in those meritorious matters. The same with uh, those seeking assistance with EI and CPP. So for further information, uh, you can go to our website. Um, and at any point, uh, if you have a legal issue or, or if you're not sure if it may be legal in nature, um, don't hesitate to call us and we will help, help you through whatever um, concern you may have. Many times a social issue is also entangled with a legal issue and um, they're hard to separate. Um, but essentially, our goal is to help our low-income community members ensure that their most basic needs are being met, and we do that uh, through the legal process. So the topics for today are uh, tenant rights and workers' rights during COVID. I want to clarify that this is legal information, which means that I cannot provide case-by-case uh, um, analysis based on specific um, uh, circumstances. And so uh, during the question period, I'll be, pro pro be providing general advice. And if you have a specific question related to your personal circumstances, it's best to call the, cl the clinic so that we can provide you with a legal analysis specific to your facts. So I'll begin with an overview of tenant law. The Residential Tenancies Act is the piece of legislation that governs landlord and tenant relationships. And so when a landlord or a tenant believes that their rights have been infringed, they can bring their grievance to the Landlord and Tenant Board, which is a tribunal similar to a court um, that has exclusive jurisdiction to apply the RTA. And that board issues orders that are legally binding. A landlord and tenant cannot then enforce their rights in small claims court, uh, with some exception, but essentially the landlord and tenant board is the only authority to adjudicate matters between landlords and tenants that are subject to the RTA. And so what this also means is that the landlord and tenant board um, is the only authority to issue and authorize evictions. The majority of tenants uh, will have their tenancy agreement protected by the Residential Tenancies Act, but there are some exceptions. I won't go through all exceptions today, uh, but the most notable exception to the application of the RTA is in circumstances where tenants are sharing a kitchen and or bathroom with their landlord or an immediate family of a member of the landlord. They unfortunately are not subject to the RTA, which means that they have less protections, especially when it comes to evictions. But for the purposes of this presentation, all of my advice will be um, with respect to tenancies that are protected 
by the Residential Tenancies Act. So, as I mentioned, the Landlord and Tenant Board is the only authority that can evict that can order eviction. So, if a landlord is intending to pursue uh, the eviction of a tenant, they must follow the process outlined by the RTA. The exception to that is if the landlord and the tenant both agree on terminating the tenancy, or if the tenant at the end of the term of their tenancy has given 60 days notice to end the tenancy. Otherwise, uh, a landlord cannot just lock your doors, harass you out, or coerce you to sign an agreement to leave. Even if they think you've done something completely egregious or unlawful, they must go through a process that entitles the tenant an opportunity to respond to their concerns and defend it. And that's where the Landlord and Tenant Board comes in. So what steps must a landlord take when pursuing a tenant's eviction? The first step is giving a tenant the notice, a notice of termination form. And so there's various notice of termination forms identified by number that are designed by the Landlord and Tenant Board. And these forms will indicate on them what the allegation is and perhaps that's that a behavior of the tenant has interfered with the landlord's lawful right or privilege and on that form, it'll say exactly the behaviors that the um, landlord is complaining of. Or for example, it could be a notice of termination form uh, based on failure to pay rent. But the first step uh, is to get one of these notice of termination forms served on you by your landlord. I want to reiterate that a tenant is not required to move by the termination date on that form. So that form is misleading in so much as it says, this is the termination date, but you are not required to move by that date. So if a tenant doesn't move by that date, the landlord is then required to file an application for eviction with the landlord and tenant board. And that would be based on having served the notice of termination to the tenant. Once the landlord files that application with the landlord and tenant board, the, the landlord and tenant board mails the application and notice of hearing form to all of the parties, tenants included. So if you have received a notice of termination form, you are waiting then to see if your landlord will act on that and you'll be checking your mail to see if they have and, and whether or not you've received the application for eviction and the corresponding notice of term, uh, pardon me, notice of hearing. Once you receive the notice of hearing, you have the opportunity to defend um, your, your landlord's application for eviction. And so there's a hearing process, just like you would see in court. Essentially, it's, it's a trial with uh, less uh less rigor in terms of the the procedural scrutiny that's required in other courts so some of the rules around evidence and procedure are relaxed in this hearing process uh, so that parties feel comfortable representing themselves with the intention of creating greater access to justice so at this hearing, the landlord must provide evidence to substantiate their claim made against the tenant. And then the tenant has the opportunity uh, to defend the claim. And even where the landlord has proven that the tenant has interfered with one of their rights, um, the landlord and tenant board does have the authority to give that tenant a second opportunity to maintain their tenancy where certain um, circumstances warrant that. So an application for eviction does not automatically mean that a tenant is doomed and that they're inevitably facing eviction. And so the landlord and tenant board after adjudicating uh, the landlord's claim will then issue an order and the order could be verbal or they could reserve judgment 
In any event, the order will be in writing and mailed to the parties. If the outcome of the case is that eviction has been ordered, then the tenant must move by the eviction date. In the event, however, that they don't, the landlord is then required to file their order with the sheriff or court enforcement officer who will then mail a notice to the tenant advising when they are coming to enforce that order for eviction by changing the locks on their door. So uh, earlier I was speaking of the notice of termination and this is the front page of an N4 notice of termination um, for non-payment of rent. And so in the top right corner, you see the N4. As you can see, uh, the tenant and landlord and address of the rental unit must be included on this form. It says, I am giving you this notice because I believe you owe me X amount in rent. And then it says, I can apply to the board to have you evicted if you do not pay this amount by. And then there's a date there. And it says, this is called the termination date or if you move out by the termination date. As I mentioned, you are not required to move out by the termination date. So as I mentioned, if you don't move out by the termination date, the landlord is forced to file an application for eviction with the LTV. And so one of the reasons why a tenant wouldn't move out by this date or even if they agree they owe arrears, they wouldn't move out by the state, is that in a hearing at the Landlord and Tenant Board, if there's exceptional circumstances, the tenant can explain what those exceptional circumstances were to explain why they fell into arrears, and they can ask the Landlord and Tenant Board for a repayment plan so that they can maintain their housing, start paying back the rent that they owe, um, or, you know, if the allegations contained in the notice of termination are bogus, if these allegations are false, then of course a tenant would want to remain in the unit forcing a hearing so that they can dispute those allegations. Voiding a notice though. Voiding a notice of termination is essentially if it's a N4 notice of a termination for arrears, it's paying the amount that's owed by the termination date. Or if it's a notice of termination based on certain behaviors complained of, then if the tenant stops those behaviors within seven days of issuance, then that notice is void. And the effect of avoided notice is that the landlord should not be filing an application for eviction because essentially what was complained of was rectified. In the event that it's voided, but they still file the application for eviction at the landlord and tenant board, a tenant has the ability to evidence that in fact, um, the notice was void. So, one of the biggest issues facing tenants these days because of COVID is the, the loss of income as a result of a loss of employment um, because, because of COVID measures um, that have either resulted in a discontinuance of the business or um, the government has mandated that it, that it close. And so we're seeing many tenants in a position of not having uh, the money that they normally would to be able to pay their rent. And so many tenants are now being issued these N4 notice of terminations claiming arrears. The requirements for these notices are that they must um, have a termination date 14 days from when it was issued to them. And it must have the correct amount of rent that's owing and the months in which non-payment -took, non took place. As I mentioned, there's two options if you get this notice. You could pay um, what's indicated in that notice, avoiding having to go to a hearing, or stay and not pay, um, which would you know, increase your risk of eviction. But if there's extenuating circumstances such as you've applied for EI 
or apply it to the CERB, um, then you would have the opportunity to defend your eviction at a hearing explaining those extenuating circumstances. Sometimes uh, tenants have paid a portion of their rent, but not all of their rent. That would still uh, entitle the landlord to file that notice of termination based on arrears. Um, but certainly, if you've been able to make some payments towards your rent arrears, that will bode well for you in a hearing because then you're showing your effort to pay rent, um, even though unfortunately people may be in a position of choosing between putting food on their table and paying their rent. People will have to budget for themselves what they need to do during these times. And fortunately, the legislation allows for an adjudicator to take these extenuating circumstances into consideration when it comes to an eviction based on arrears um, so that tenants are afforded an opportunity uh, to defend their eviction based on their extenuating circumstances. So where a tenant has been able to evidence that there were extenuating circumstances that led to their arrears, the landlord and tenant board will generally give that person an opportunity to maintain their tenancy with a repayment plan. So they would be issued an order that states the terms and conditions they must abide by. And so if a tenant is given an order with a repayment plan, and so long as they comply with it, they can remain housed. If, however, a tenant breaches a term in that agreement, the landlord is then entitled to file an application for eviction based on the breach of the order. And the tenant would receive an, uh, a termination, um, or pardon me, an eviction order in the mail for that breach without having first been given another opportunity to defend their eviction. So it's very important that if a tenant does receive um, an order with terms and conditions, it's very important that they comply with that um, to ensure that they maintain their tenancy. So for example, if post COVID, there are hearings at the landlord and tenant board and a tenant has proven that there were extenuating circumstances that led to arrears and that they have some money um, coming in and they've proposed a reasonable repayment plan, the landlord and tenant board would issue an order stating that lawful rent is due on the first of the month, as it always is, is legally um, required. And then a lump, uh, pardon me, a repayment plan portion um, is, is, is owing either on the first or another point in the month, such as the 15th, um, as a repayment plan to recover previous arrears. So in this scenario that I have on the screen here, a repayment plan could say the tenant pays $200 on the first or 15th of the month for the next three, three months, and the tenant shall also pay the landlord the filing fee that they paid when they filed their L1 application for eviction. And then it would read, failure to comply with the repayment plan will result in immediate eviction of the tenant. So while uh, arrears are owing, uh, there is an opportunity to try and enter into a repayment plan to maintain housing. And the ways to do that, as I mentioned, is to demonstrate that the failure to pay was for reasons beyond your control. Ideally evidence good faith efforts to pay. So even if someone can't pay full rent, make some payments. If a person has, because of these precarious times, withheld rent for a short period of time to save, to have that slush fund to make sure they can meet their other most basic needs. Ideally have some savings of that on the side so that when you do make a proposal to the landlord and tenant board, you do have some money to pay immediately to show that you do have an intention to maintain your tenancy. And number four, evidence that the means to pay your rent is now rectified. So if you are unable to pay in the past, 
provide evidence that you now have the means to pay. And then of course, propose that repayment plan. So evidence that tenants can rely on um, include documentary and testimonial evidence, but ideally documentary evidence is preferred. So when paying your rent, try and get rent receipts, receipts, your landlord's legally required to provide those to you, pay your money, um, pay your rent using checks or money orders, email transfers. Um, if you've paid by cash and didn't receive a receipt, you could look up your bank account records. You would want to provide proof of job loss if that was the reason for your failure to pay rent. You could um, retrieve your record of employment, your application for the CERB, or other income supplement programs such as EI, ODSP, OW, CPP, what have you. And so these are uh, forms of evidence that a tenant can use to try and save their tenancy by substantiating their claim at the landlord and tenant board. At no point can your landlord lock you out. As I mentioned, the landlord and tenant board is the only authority that can issue an eviction. And even if you have not paid your rent, your landlord does not have the right to change the locks on your door. That is one of the most egregious violations of a tenant's rights because the RTA was designed to protect tenants, knowing that there is a power imbalance between landlords and tenants. And given that as a society, we recognize for the most part that housing is, is a basic need and, and in fact is a, a human right. So your landlord cannot change the locks on the door they can't turn off your utilities. They cannot stop maintaining the, the unit and disregard your need for repairs, even if you haven't paid rent. Your, their, their obligations with respect to those are remaining, even if you haven't paid your full rent. They also can't harass you. Under uh, common law and the Residential Tenancies Act, the term harassment is quite a high um, threshold to meet and unfortunately many people feel that you know a landlord asking asking them to pay their rent constitutes harassment but it, it doesn't nonetheless a landlord can't harass you so that could look like calling the tenant constantly at all hours demanding payment threatening unlawful eviction using derogatory abusive language towards the tenant attending the unit repeatedly, unannounced without notice, breaching your privacy, pressuring a tenant to sign an agreement to terminate their tenancy. Circumstantially, all of those things combined would, would constitute harassment and uh, would, would be grounds for a tenant to uh, pursue a, an application against their landlord for the breach of their rights, which is uh, to live free without harassment. So a notice form that is quite common uh, for landlords to try and pressure tenants to sign in difficult times or when they want to capitalize on the current rent market and they want to re-rent the unit at a higher rate um, or if a tenant hasn't paid their rent um, and the landlord's frustrated with this, um, some landlords will pressure tenants into signing what's called an N11 agreement, an agreement to terminate their tenancy. So in red, I have here, do not sign without giving, get, being given legal advice. Um, this agreement to terminate tenancy terminates your tenancy. It is a contract that is binding between the landlord and the tenant. And even if a tenant does not have alternative housing to move into, by the termination date, uh, the landlord is still entitled to file that agreement with the landlord and tenant board, who will then issue an eviction um, and, and essentially will enforce that eviction. And so landlords will sometimes use this to circumvent the landlord and tenant board process because they know that um, perhaps they don't have a legal basis to evict the tenant. And so a way to do that um, with avoiding that process, which requires them to evidence their claim and, and meet thresholds, 
is to the harass tenants into signing these, these agreements. Um, so I would encourage any tenant uh, to get legal advice with respect to any document that they have their landlord, um, that they've been given by their landlord, um, just to make sure that they understand what they're signing. If your landlord has locked you out, uh, call the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic immediately and we can help you with the documents that need to be filed with the Landlord and Tenant Board um, to restore your tenancy. And you can also, in the most immediate, if you feel safe, um, call the police and they should attend your unit and uh, try to keep the, the peace and hopefully uh, they'll advise the landlord that they need to go through the legal process to, to evict that, that tenant. And so if a tenant has been locked out or if you've been forced out of your unit outside of this lawful process, call our office and we can help you file a T2 application with the Landlord and Tenant Board. And right now during COVID, um, illegal eviction applications are being given priority uh, because of the stakes involved and they'll be processed fairly immediately. And even if a hearing hasn't taken place yet, um, an interim order will more likely than not be issued by the board and that interim order would be sent to your landlord and to you indicating that the landlord has an obligation to open up those doors and restore you to possession of the unit. Some COVID related concerns. There are some landlords that are asking tenants to write out a repayment plan and some letters to tenants that I've seen sound very compassionate and perhaps some of them are well intended, but I think for the most part, um, people in these precarious times who are balancing uh, their needs with a uh, limited budget will see this as more stress triggering than anything. Uh, but tenants, you do not have any obligation uh, to enter into a repayment plan with your landlord um, prior to any hearing. Um, I would actually encourage tenants not to um, so that um, they can go through uh, the lawful process at the landlord and tenant board and enter into a repayment plan there. If, however, a tenant has entered into a repayment plan with their landlord, uh, this shouldn't pre pre prejudice them or replace their rights at, in, a, in the LTB hearing process. And if you are a tenant who's entered into a repayment plan with your landlord outside of a repayment plan ordered by the LTB, if you breach that repayment plan with your landlord, your landlord can't evict you. They still would have to issue you a notice of termination based on non-payment of rent and go through the process at the landlord and tenant board. So these repayment plan side agreements um, are side agreements with your landlord. And so they do not replace um, the process at the landlord and tenant board. It's advisable to not enter into one, but if you do, you haven't, uh, you haven't abandoned um, any of your rights. Um, so, so don't worry about that. As well, some landlords are asking tenants to provide evidence of their financial situations during COVID. And sometimes this takes, this request is taking place within the context of wanting to enter into a repayment plan. So um, it's advisable not to uh, you don't have any obligation to provide your landlord, landlord with evidence of your financial situation. Of course, if it gets to a hearing at the Landlord and Tenant Board, then to defend your eviction, you're going to want to provide evidence of your extenuating circumstances and your financial situation. But in advance of that, you have no obligation to provide that to your landlord. And you also do not have the obligation to sign an agreement to terminate your tenancy, that N11 form. So it's advisable during these times to pay your rent if you can, but if not, pay some um, or at least save some so that when you do 
have to attend a hearing, you, you do have the opportunity to evidence uh, that you do have some money aside to, to make those good faith payments and, um, and ideal, ideally minimize your debt because even when there is a repayment plan, it can be quite arduous given that that repayment plan is on top of your lawful rent due on the first of the month. In terms of health and safety um, during COVID, landlords still do have the right to enter your unit, provided that they've provided you with 24 hours written notice, that the notice has indicated the purpose of their entry, and that the purpose is lawful. Um, even though they have that blanket right to, to enter um, pursuant to those notice requirements, there has been notice to, to landlords um, on the Landlord and Tenant Board website and through other legal counsel who've encouraged landlords to really only be attending units if there's serious concerns, like serious maintenance concerns that need attention or emergencies. Uh, I will note that the notice requirements to enter are waived when there is an emergency. So a landlord is not required to provide you with 24 hour written notice if there's a flood or fire in your unit. As well, um, they should be taking mitigation measures during this time, such as wearing gloves or masks when they enter. If you're a tenant though, that is immune compromised or has COVID or has a loved one who's residing with you, who is severely at risk of, of getting infected, um, and you're very concerned that someone, either your landlord or an agent of the landlord, such as a contractor, is going to enter and that there's a real risk of contraction, it's best that you put that concern in writing, retain a copy and give it to them because they should be working with you um, and respecting that. And there are likely some human rights code related um, protections there. So um, the human rights code um, does apply to landlord and tenant situations and tenants who have code related protections um, what that means is that you can't be discriminated discriminated against. Um, and so in this context, if you're a tenant with a disability, then your landlord has a requirement to make sure that they work with you um, to uh, craft their policies in a way that respects um, and, and minimizes any interference to your disability related need. And so that would apply in this context whereby you're putting them on notice that there's a disability or a medical condition that would be exasperated um, by any entrance during this time and that um, they shouldn't be entering um, because because of, of those concerns and, and they should be respecting that. So perhaps many of you have heard that there's a moratorium on evictions during this time. What that means is that the Landlord and Tenant Board um, is not issuing evictions, um, processing certain applications for evictions and where there were outstanding um, orders for evictions, those aren't being enforced. The exception to that is if a landlord has filed an application for eviction based on an allegation that the tenant has seriously um, impaired safety or committed an illegal act in the unit. Except for that, um, landlord applications are not being processed. So if you are a tenant who it has fallen into arrears, even if your landlord has filed an application for eviction based on those arrears, uh, the Landlord and Tenant Board is not processing those at the time. That does not mean that your obligation to pay rent has been suspended. It just means that your, uh, your landlord's application for eviction will be processed at a later date. In contrast, uh, tenant applications continue to be processed. So if you're a tenant, who believes your rights have been interfered with, um, your landlord's locked you out, 
they've turned off your uh, utilities, they've harassed you, or they haven't maintained the unit up to health and safety standards, your tenant applications are still being processed. And as I mentioned earlier, tenant applications that are claiming um, an illegal lock out are being processed expeditiously. Hearings are, being, are taking place by telephone. And um, if you have filed a tenant application, you will uh, have what's called a case management hearing by telephone uh, in advance of any actual hearing that tries the evidence. And that is a settlement conference. So I won't go through that whole process, but essentially, um, Landlord applications, with the exception of those uh, illegal act applications, are not being processed. Tenant applications are, and hearings are taking place by telephone. If telephone is inaccessible or um, inappropriate in the circumstance, which I think for the most part, uh, due to a lack of procedural fairness and other issues it is, there, there is um, opportunity for tenants to seek an adjournment pending the reopening of these hearings so that they can take place in person rather by telephone and our clinic can assist you with doing that. So any tenant who's received a notice of termination or an application for eviction, a notice of hearing if they're locked out. If you're concerned that your tenant rights have been violated, please give us a call and we'll be able to provide you uh, with assistance. Aside from a notice of termination based on arrears, um, very common notices of termination um, that we see are notice of terminations whereby the landlord is claiming that they or a family member personally requires the unit. And so the notice requirements in those uh, notice of terminations are 60 days from the date of issuance and the landlord has an obligation to pay the tenant the equivalent of one month's worth of rent. Again, a tenant is not required to move by the termination date in this notice. And if they don't, the, the um, the landlord's forced to file an application for eviction based on this. And there are sometimes um, bogus N12s issued to tenants uh, because sometimes these are the easiest um, applications to win at the landlord and tenant board. And so um, if you are a tenant who either does not believe that their landlord intends to move in or if you do believe they actually are intending to move in, but you need more time to move um, because the market is quite difficult and you haven't secured alternative housing, you can remain in the unit and then force the landlord to file an application for eviction where you have the opportunity to defend your tenancy or ask for more time to move. An N12 can also be issued on the basis that the purchaser requires the unit. So when a landlord has sold the home and there is an agreement of purchase and sale and the purchaser intends um, to move in, that you can also be issued an N12. If the purchaser does not intend to move in um, and the tenant hasn't been evicted, the purchaser or any new building owner assumes a tenant's lease on the same terms and conditions as the original lease. So tenants out there, even if your landlord sold the property, you're not automatically evicted. Your lease continues and the new owner of the property automatically assumes that. Another notice of termination that is commonly issued is the N13 notice where a landlord's claiming that um, either they intend to demolish the rental unit or there's extensive repairs um, that require the tenant to leave uh, or they intend to convert it to another use. The notice requirements for that are 120 days. And again, a tenant's not required to move by that date. If you're a tenant who's received that, then um, feel free to call our clinic and we'll provide you with 
um, an analysis as to whether we think that that N13 notice has complied with the, te the technical requirements and then whether or not we believe that it meets the threshold uh, to warrant eviction. I won't go through all that now because we're running out of time, but just know that that is a notice that can be issued. Um, but again, a tenant still has the opportunity to defend against that. And I've spoken mostly about circumstances where tenants are facing eviction, but um, the Landlord and Tenant Board is also uh there to enforce tenant rights so if you feel that your rights have been infringed uh, you do have the right to file an application against your landlord there and our clinic would be happy to provide you with advice with respect to that um, many times we see uh, tenants uh, who uh, need to file a t6 maintenance um, application against their landlord because they have just let the unit fall into disrepair and they haven't been repairing. So um, if you do want assistance, uh, you can visit the Landlord and Tenant Board website, um, our website, and then you can also receive guidance from our clinic. So at this time, I'll take questions related to um, Landlord and Tenant concerns. Okay, thanks so much, Stephanie, for this first portion of the, web, the workshop. Uh, we have a few questions here. Folks, please feel free to continue to put your questions either in the chat uh, part of the live stream or you can put them into that little uh, Google Doc if you don't want to have them associated with your Facebook account. So our first question is, what do we do if we've repeatedly requested rent receipts but they've refused? It's probably because they've been maintaining uh, this as their primary residence for tax purposes, but they've never lived here? Good question. So um, you would be able to ideally put a demand letter together, um, demanding your rent receipt and, and, and keep a copy of that demand letter, letter. And then you can file a T2, uh, which is the tenant application form claiming that your lawful rights or privileges have been interfered with. So if you go to the Landlord and Tenant Board website, you can find under the form section, the T2 form, and you would be able to file that with the LTB claiming that um, receipts haven't been provided. The board has the authority to issue you compensation, um, reflecting the breach of your rights and also an order um, demanding that they provide you with those receipts. Right, thank you. Stephanie, you're getting lots of uh, thumbs up and hearts on Facebook. Oh, great. <laughs> um, okay, our next question is, what does Bill 184 mean for Section 206 evictions based on breach of agreement? Can you walk us through the process of what they are proposing? Okay, so um, what they are proposing is that when someone breaches a condition in an order, so if you were required to pay $200 in repayment plan, plan and you don't, then um, the landlord and tenant, the landlord can file an application saying you breached that and then the tenant is, is sent a eviction order without having a hearing. So as the law currently stands, when there's an agreement mediated or ordered by the landlord and tenant board, the legislation allows for a clause that says that the if there's a breach, the landlord is forced to reopen the application, meaning that if there's a breach, the application goes before the landlord and tenant board and there's a hearing which would give the tenant an opportunity to explain their extenuating circumstances. With Bill 184, that reopen and right to a new hearing um, is removed so that if there's a breach, automatically an eviction is ordered without there being a hearing process. 
As it currently stands though, most mediated agreements and most orders already have a clause that if it's breached, that then um, an order for eviction will be issued without the hearing. Um, but, you know, with Bill 184, the option for that reopen, um, which provides for a hearing and, and a full sum defense is eliminated. I will say though, that even where a tenant breaches, whether 184 passes or not, um, even if there's a breach and the landlord files and they get an eviction order based on that breach, there is still an opportunity for tenants to file within 10 days of receiving an order, a motion to set aside that order saying that they didn't breach because there's times where a landlord lies and says there's a breach or there's times where there was a breach, but it's really minimal. So for example, you know, the tenant complied with the repayment plan, paid all the arrears, but did so maybe a day late. So if you are a tenant in that situation, call our clinic immediately so we can help you through that, that process of uh, setting aside that order for eviction. Cool, thank you. Um, the next question is, what rights, if any, would tenants have if their landlord had, to sign, had, sign, had made them sign a standard lease when the landlord lives in the house and uses the shared space, which exempts tenants from any protections under the RTA. Can eviction be initiated at any time? So, if, as you say, the agreement exempts the RTA, even if, you know, the standard lease has been signed, that, um, that doesn't change the nature of your tenancy. So if your, your tenancy isn't protected by the RTA, then the standard um, common law rule, so the unwritten rule, but the rule created through years of jurisprudence is that your notice period by your non-RTA protected lease should, the notice period for termination would be equivalent to um, the period in which you pay your rent. So if you're a person who's non-RTA protected and you pay on a monthly basis and your landlord wants you to leave, they should be giving you one month notice to move. If you pay on a weekly basis, they should be giving you one week to move. That doesn't mean that that happens. Many times non-RTA protected tenants um, receive notice from their landlord the day before, or if they're really uh, lacking a heart, they'll say, I want you to leave right now and you're trespassing. And so if they say you're trespassing, um, then they will likely call the police. And if the police see that you don't have a written tenancy agreement, and if the police see that um, you're residing with your landlord, they'll likely facilitate that eviction. And so if that were to take place, um, the only recourse would be filing an application in small claims court for the return of any rent that you've paid, but otherwise you're not going to necessarily be restored to possession. So unfortunately, in practical terms, anyone who is not protected by the RTA really could face an eviction arbitrarily at any time. Um, so this one is a little bit of a, it, it's a tough question. So um, what do we do when our rights are being undermined by elected government even as we speak? Apparently only those with money are allowed to have their legal right honored in Ontario and increasingly in Canada. Those opposed are organized and methodical in their approach much like organized crime, and apparently run the city and help fund initiatives eroding all of our rights. So, um, absolutely, the landlord lobby is, is very large. And depending on the preferences of our elected officials, 
many of them uh, will align their interests with the landlord lobby. And so what that means is that legal clinics, tenants, um, ACORN needs to organize and have their voices heard. Um, the Bill 184 was before the standing committee today. And so uh, many legal clinics deposed at that committee um, explaining the pros and cons of that piece of legislation, predominantly advocating that it be overturned because it does not achieve uh, the tenant protection um, that its title claims. And so the best way to do that is to continue to um, lobby, advocate with your members of provincial parliament, and also with your city councillors, because there's many ways in which perhaps the law is written well, but the practices um, allow landlords to really circumvent that process because of a power dynamic. And so um, many policies that are made at the local municipal level have a real impact on tenants. So for example, when the city decided to support the LRT and not provide um, adequate alternative housing for those homes that were being expropriated. You know, that's a local decision that has increased um, the lack of housing in our, in our community, which has resulted in predatory landlords having the upper hand uh, because there's a lack of affordable housing. There's other policies such as grants with the city um, that are given to landlords to improve their properties. And then landlords are motivated to improve the properties with um, tax incentives and these subsidies. And what they do is improve the uh, aesthetics of the property um, so that they can increase the market value. And during that process, they force out long-term tenants whose rent has been locked in. So it's really important that members of our community recognize that it's not just at the provincial level, but there's policies that certainly don't change the legislation because it's provincial, but there's policies at the local level that can sort of grease the wheel of um, landlord interests at the compromise of, of tenants' interests of adequate and affordable housing. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, it's 8 p.m. now, so I'm just gonna give you one more question and then we'll move on uh, so we have enough time for the next portion of the workshop. So the final question um, for this section is, what can I do if my building has poor, uh, is poorly maintained and uh, they are using unlicensed workers doing plumbing and pest control? Unfortunately, this is quite common, um, but there's many things you can do. The first is called property standards with the city of Hamilton. By calling property standards, you will get a practical and more immediate solution because a bylaw officer will attend the property and observe what bylaw infractions related to structure and what have you have been violated. They will issue your landlord in order to repair and then issue you a copy and then they will follow up and ensure that they've complied. So it's the fastest way to actually get repairs done. And so I would encourage people to uh, contact property standards. If you've got pest issues, call public health. Um, also make sure you're taking photos, uh, send a demand letter to your landlord and keep a copy. That way um, you are, are starting to build the evidence that you can use if you file a T6 maintenance application against your landlord at the landlord and tenant board. And then if they're using unlicensed contractors, um, you could call the Ontario uh, Labor Relations Board to make um, complaints. Thank 
Okay, great, thank you so much. So folks, please feel free to continue to put your questions either in the chat uh, function of the live stream or in that shared Google document for this next portion of the workshop. And I'll pass it over to you again, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to provide some information about workers' rights during COVID. Um, the first is uh, eligibility for federal income replacement benefits. So um, what the government has done is they've, they've intertwined EI eligibility and the CERB eligibility. Um, so if you're a person who stopped working because of COVID-19, so you've lost your job, um, you were terminated um, because uh, the business did not um, remain, um, either because it had to close, because it wasn't profitable, what have you, um, or um, your boss no longer has, your employer no longer has work for you, or the government has, um, uh, issued closure, um, then, and you're a person who uh, earned more than five thousand dollars in 2019. Um, if you're an employee, a person self-employed, a contract worker, um, you can qualify for um, EI regular benefits, and you'd also qualify um, for the CERB. You wouldn't get both. Um, I would suggest you apply to the CERB and um, that way if the CERB is not continued by the federal government you'll have the opportunity to then transition into applying for EI regular benefits. If you're a person who um, has had to take time off work to care for a loved one who um, is ill or is ill because of COVID, um, or if you yourself have become ill as a result of COVID, then um, you'd be applying for EI sick benefits. And to qualify for the CERB through Service Canada, you must have stopped working for seven days in a row. And ideally, uh, your employer would have provided your record of employment um, to Service Canada um, within five days of uh, stopping st the stoppage of work. Um, if you apply through the CRA, um, you must have stopped working for 14 consecutive days in a row. There's also the CESB, which is the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. Um, you must be, to qualify, you must be in a post-secondary program uh, between December 1st, 2019 and August 31st, 2020, or graduated from high school in 2020 and applied for a post-secondary program that's beginning um, before February 1st, 2021. Um, you also, to be eligible, must um, prove that you're unable to find work or unable to work as a result of COVID-19. Citizens, permanent residents, anyone registered as um, an Indian under the Indian Act, protected persons under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, um, all would, would, would be eligible to, to apply for the CESB. And there's also the Ontario Emergency Assistance Program um, for those who need, who are in financial emergency because of COVID, um, such as not having enough money for food and housing, and if you live in Ontario, um, and if you're a person not already receiving OW or ODSP, you could qualify. Um, unfortunately, details have not yet been released. Um, and so there is the website there um, that you could turn to for updates. Um, if you're on Ontario Works, um, you would be able to, um, or pardon me, if you're not on Ontario Works um, and you're receiving that Ontario Emergency Assistance, you would be able to then transition to Ontario Works after. 
I'm sorry, there's not much more to say about that program because um, not, not enough has been released yet. And then if you're a person who is receiving Ontario Works or ODSP and you're not receiving the CERB um, and you have more or greater financial needs um, directly caused uh, by COVID, um, then uh, there's a benefit um, for singles uh, on OW um, in the amount of $100. Um, that can be issued in addition to your regular benefits. And then uh, families may be eligible um, up to $200 extra to supplement their benefits. And um, individuals can apply through OW or ODSP for that additional income. So now I'll address some common commonly, I meant to write asked, commonly asked questions and issues facing uh, workers amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, we know that some workplaces have asked people to stay home um, to work or to stay home um, and they don't have any work while they're at home. Others have been forced to close and then others have been given temporary layoffs. And so, your rights as a worker will um, change depending on the circumstance you find yourself. So um, I'm providing right now some legal information, but ideally um, you're gonna wanna call our clinic for legal advice because there are just so many moving parts when it comes to employment law. So to the left um, com column, you see that a list of when you have the right to be paid. So people during COVID, you're employed, um, you are still working, um, you're entitled to pay. If you are working remotely but not going into the office, you're entitled to pay. Um, if your employer elects to have you remain working at home, um, even though there's no actual health risk, um, and you're still working from home, you're entitled to pay. If your contract for employment offers paid sick and vacation days, um, um, and your employer agrees to allow you to use those um, while your work has stopped, for example, um, for example, um, you're, you're no longer working, um, you're temporarily laid off, um, or you're on con or whatever your contract says, if it does include paid sick days um, or vacation days, then you would still be paid um, if you agree to that with your, with your employer. Your employer does not have an obligation, however, to pay you um, if, all employees have been sent home because of an actual risk um, and there are no work at home options and you're not performing work. So at that point, you'd be essentially applying for the CERB. If, you, if your place of employment continues um, to provide you with work, um, and you're just electing to self-isolate and not work, then you don't necessarily have an obligation to be um, paid. Your employer also does not, is not necessarily required to pay you if you need to be home to care for or recover um, from COVID. Um, the exception to that is if you have an employment contract that provides you with sick leave. If the government has forced your place of employment to shut down, then um, your, your employer is not obligated to continue to pay you. Um, if you're self-quarantining and there's no work at home options, um, then, you're, then your employer does not have an obligation to pay you. Can an employer require you to self-quarantine? Yes, if there are 
legitimate health related concerns. So they can't constructively use this as a means to, um, to uh, essentially constructively like fire you or create conditions that don't exist um, to justify um, forcing you to go home. So there has to be an actual legitimate health related reason why they're asking you to self quarantine. So if you were a person who traveled or you do have the symptoms or someone else um, at work has come down with COVID and you have come into contact with them, then it's reasonable that your employer require you to self quarantine. And like I said, if you are self self quarantining, um, and for legitimate reasons, uh, your landlord's or pardon me, your employer is not required to pay you during that period. If, however, your um, employment contract gives you paid vacation, you could um, use that there um, and and be paid. But otherwise, you wouldn't be paid if you were self quarantining and it was for a legitimate reason. Can an employer's place me on temporary layoff without pay as a result of COVID. So yes, only if you have agreed to such a layoff in a written, and it's in a written contract of your employment. So in most cases, employers can only place you on temporary leave of absence for 13 weeks in a 20 week consecutive period, or up to 35 weeks in a 52 week period so long as they continue to pay you benefits, pay, or other aspects of compensation. Otherwise, it's considered an outright termination. So an employer cannot put you on temporary layout with, layoff without pay if there's no contract or provision stipulating such in your employment contract. Uh, there must be consent for that for that to take place, and so um, because doing so may mean you are terminated and um, owe termination or severance pay. So seek legal advice if your employer is trying to temporarily lay you off without pay claiming it's a result of COVID and, and you don't have an employment contract, before you enter en into any agreement, uh, make sure you contact the legal clinic for advice because you could unintentionally be agreeing to your own termination. Another common question is, what if I need to be off work to care for my spouse, child, or parent? Under the Employment Standards Act, um, you have, there's a number of job protected unpaid leaves of ab absences for which you can apply for EI. So um, if you are a person who needs to care for um, a family member in cases of severe illness, risk of death, um, or you need a family medical leave, um, if there's critical illness um, for a child or another adult, then EI um, does have um, paid leave for you through their program. Um, if, uh, and so that income supplement is outside of your employment contract with your employer. So if your employer is not paying you while you're sick, while you have to care for a family member that's sick, then you would apply for EI. In terms of your relationship with your employer though, if you're a person who is still employed during COVID and a family member becomes ill and you need to care for them, um, a new piece of law that I haven't touched on with respect to employment um, that would apply to your situation is the Human Rights Code. So the Ontario Human Rights Code protects uh, people based on their family status. And so if you are a person who needs your work to be flexible with you because you are now a caregiver to an ill 
child or parent or anyone who's dependent on you, then your employer has an obligation to accommodate you per your family status, meaning that they have to work with you to a point of undue hardship to try and help you maintain your employment while also um, being able to attend to your caregiver obligations. So if that is something that's taking place for you, call or pardon me, write your employer, explain the circumstances, um, ideally get a medical note um, and explain what it is you need in terms of a change in perhaps your job, your, your employment duties, your role, um, your hours, if you need to work at home. So they have an obligation to uh, sit down with you and try and talk about what ways um, your uh, work can change to be flexible to this new need. Um, and if they don't do that um, and just fire you because uh, you have these new needs, um, you may have a basis to file a discrimination claim um, against them uh, at the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal. Can my employer fire me for refusing um, to come to, into work due to COVID? Well, if you aren't coming to work because you think that there is unsafe work conditions, um, then the, on, the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, provides protection to you. So uh, an employee is entitled to refuse unsafe work without reprisal under that piece of legislation. So this includes refusing to work in an environment where you will actually, and the operative word here is you'll actually be exposed to the COVID virus and or may cause you to expose those more vulnerable to severe versions of the virus. So um, no, uh, an employer can't fire you um, if you're refusing unsafe um, work conditions. If you are fired uh, for refusing unsafe conditions, uh, or refusing to work because of unsafe con conditions, or you're being threatened, um, complain to the Ontario Labour Relations Board. And if you are in fact fired, um, then uh, call our office uh, because uh, you may have um, a legitimate uh, claim. As I mentioned, the uh, Ontario Human Rights Code applies uh, to the employment um, context. So um, if you're a person who's unfortunately contracted the virus, um, you will be considered to have a disability uh, pursuant to uh, the Ontario Human Rights Code. And so if you're a person living with a disability, you receive protection from that code, meaning that you cannot be discriminated against um, by a service provider, such as your employer and a landlord for that matter. So if you um, have contracted COVID, you receive protection from that code, meaning that your employer can't discriminate against you, they can't fire you, um, they need to go through that accommodation process that I that I spoke to earlier, meaning that they have to try and adjust their policies and procedures, um, reflecting your personal needs in a flexible approach. And both parties, both employer and employee, have to be compromising and try and work out a, a way to maintain your employment while while respecting um, your disability related needs. So as a general rule, in employ employers in Ontario can fire anyone at any time, provided that they give um, the employer employed their entitlements to termination pay and or severance pay if applicable. 
However, as I mentioned in the last uh, screen, if someone is fired directly due to a diagnosis, symptoms, or the perception that they have COVID, that will likely be a serious violation of the Ontario Human Rights Code and its uh, discrimination on the basis of disability, which provides grounds for a human rights application to the HRTO. Can my employer require me to provide a medical note to substantiate my COVID-related absence? Uh, the straightforward answer is yes. Uh, but they shouldn't be unreasonable about it. So, so, so long as you are having open communication and advising them that you are endeavoring to get um, medical, a medical note um, and that you have provided a medical note from a verified medical professional, um, your employer should be um, accepting that as evidence. Can I get EI if I've been required to quarantine? The answer is yes, you would apply for EI sick benefits. Um, for those who um, are applying because of COVID, the government has waived the one week waiting period for EI sick benefits. So usually when you're applying, you have to wait a week from the last time uh, you worked before applying to EI sick benefits, but in the COVID circumstance, um, you can apply immediately. And there's a dedicated phone line for EI COVID related claims, uh, which is on the screen here at 1-833-381-2725. So if uh, you are required to stay at home with a loved one and you're their main caregiver or you yourself are sick, or if you've been required to self-quarantine, you can apply for EI sick benefits immediately. So if your employer has been ordered to close uh, due to the state of emergency, um, you uh, can apply for uh, the CERB. Um, and again, um, it acts and operates just like EI. Um, the only difference if uh, you're if you're applying for the CERB or EI regular benefits is you're still subject to that one week waiting period. So if you've been temporarily laid off or um, the government has ordered shutdown of your place of employment, um, you do have to wait a week um, prior to applying for EI regular benefits or the CERB. Employers are required to send uh, your record of employment to Service Canada, and um, that should be received within five days of the interruption of your earnings. If that hasn't taken place, then you can complain to this to uh, Service Canada. And so at this point, um, this concludes my brief presentation. Um, I tried to keep it brief. Uh, but I know there's probably many questions. Uh, I'm happy to field those now. Um, and if you want any other um, legal advice um, that we haven't touched on tonight, or if you need a more fulsome response, uh, please don't hesitate to call the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic. Myself or my other colleagues will have a chance to speak with you. Even if it's not um, a pressing legal issue, um, in your life at the moment, but you just have a general question, um, we'll be able to answer that for you. So please utilize our service. We're here for a reason and, and don't hesitate to call. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's uh, so wonderful to be able to get this overview tonight. Um, you were telling me, just before we go to questions, you were telling me uh, about HCLC's uh, interpreters. Could you just give a quick overview of that? So um, aside from there being many um, individuals in our office who are multilingual, um, we, uh, and inclusive of um, making sure we have um, legal services available in French, uh, if you're a person whose uh, English is not their first language, uh, 
we do have interpreters uh, that we can call instantaneously um, so that we can provide you with advice in your language of choice. So that isn't a barrier. Um, if you're a person who signs, I'm, I'm very sorry you haven't had um, that access um, to um, ASL signing during this presentation, but um, if you are uh, a person who utilizes ASL, uh, we can get that for you. And if you're a person who um, needs to receive legal advice in another language aside from the languages that um, we speak, um, then we can get interpreters um, on the phone with us um, immediately. Uh, so please do not feel that um, that is a barrier to accessing our services. That's so great. Thank you so much. Um, so let's just see what we have in terms of questions. And folks, if you have other questions, um, please feel free to put them either in the chat or in the Google Doc that we've shared. So Stephanie, our question, this is the only question here right now, and it says, what can we do if a family member has been incorrectly placed on CERB through EI? It's often taken, taken hours to reach Service Canada alone. Okay, so my understanding is they were given CERB as opposed to EI. If they applied for EI, regular benefits, the government should have only issued them EI. Um, the only way to rectify this would be to call Service Canada as you have. Um, the CRA may be faster, although I doubt it. Um, I would, there's the CERB regular line, but I think um, the 1833381 number may streamline you. If not, write a letter. That way you maintain a copy so that if they ever um, claim that they gave you money that they weren't entitled to, you can show your efforts to rectify this. And certainly uh, the CRA and Service Canada, unfortunately, um, commits errors too. Um, and there's ways in which um, people can challenge decisions made by them. So if after all of this, uh, anyone gets a letter saying they were given more EI than entitled to, or they were given a letter saying that they received the CERB when they weren't entitled to it, there's actually a legal process that our clinic can walk you through um, to, to file uh, defenses to those decisions made by uh, the CRA and the government. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a quick resolution to this problem in the meantime, aside from what you're already doing, I'd encourage you to call that number. Uh, you could also try to streamline this by going to your um, member of parliament. Uh, but generally speaking, um, the EI and the CERB benefit are kind of treated the same right now. So the government may see them as the same in your personal circumstance. Um, so the designation as CERB versus EI um, may not have any impact um, on, on, on this person whatsoever. Just have a clarification question from the person who asked this question. They're asking when you're uh, when you're saying uh, that they should write a letter. Who should that letter be addressed to? Uh, Service Canada. Great. So that's all we have um, for questions on this uh, section. So I just wanted to reiterate that Stephanie's provided a bunch of really amazing resources that are available on our website now. Uh, and the link is there in the chat, but you can, you can find it pretty easily if you go to theinc.ca and look under programs um, and it'll be there. So um, the other thing I want to say is uh, if 
if you only caught a portion of this workshop, uh, we, were, we will be making it available on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll also be posting a recording of it on our YouTube channel. So it'll be available and you can come back to it. The only thing I will say is with, with any sort of legal advice, sometimes things change. So just bear in mind that uh, you may, if, you know, if you're watching way in the future, things might have, uh, things might have changed. So always check and uh, feel free to call the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic for any advice. Um, so I also want to take a moment to thank our funders. Uh, for making this possible, the Insight Foundation for the Arts, the Canada Council for the Arts, and Mohawk College. And of course, uh, thank you to our partners, the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic and Factory Media Center. And a big, 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 big thank you to Stephanie for being here tonight, for making all of this a little bit less intimidating for us and um, providing all of these resources and telling us about all the amazing work that you do at the Legal Clinic. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for tuning in.